Hello Netrunner fans and welcome to my 2015 retrospective. In this video we're going to be looking at some of the changes and major trends that occurred throughout the year and I'm also going to be giving my picks for the top 10 cards of each side. The first half of this video is going to look at the corpse side of the game. The second half we're going to look at the runner side of the game. And at the end of each part, I'm going to give you my pick for the worst card in each side of the game. Before we get into the analysis, let's talk first of all about what was actually released throughout the year. We started the year with a big box in the form of Order and Chaos. Then we saw the release of the entire Sand Sand Cycle 6 data packs. And then we ended the year with Data and Destiny, the latest big box that came out in about October. Assuming you paid the manufacturer's suggested retail price in US dollars and purchased one of every product, you would have spent $149.60 throughout the year, or that comes out to about $12.47 a month. My first major trend of the year is the rise of NBN Butcher Shop. Generally speaking, this is a deck that tries to use both the Astro Script thing as well as flatline cards like Scorched Earth to have two different paths to victory. One of the reasons that this is possible is that we saw a lot of good new flatline tools this year that were pretty much only used in NBN. This coincided with some new anti-fast advanced tools that the runner also gained access to. So the general trend was to shift away from doing pure fast advance and instead considering also using Scorched Earth and things like that. We also saw kind of a shifting trend with the fast advance decks, the ones that wanted to go pure fast advance, because they had to deal with these new anti-fast advance tools. And we'll be talking about that a lot in the runner video. My second major trend is the change in Glacier archetypes. We saw RP being the dominant way to play Glacier at the beginning of the year and the end of last year. And while RP is definitely still strong, it's faded somewhat in popularity as we've seen other factions get access to some new cards that have made them a little more competitive as a Glacier archetype. Nowadays, HB Engineering the Future is definitely the Tier 1 most popular Glacier deck, and there's definitely some reasons for that we'll talk about in this list. We also saw Blue Sun pretty consistently in the mix, and now with Data and Destiny, we've seen a lot of people talking about NBN Glacier. My third major trend of the year is the push of Wayland to the periphery of the competitive scene. This is mainly because Wayland is overshadowed by other factions that do its archetypes better. NBN and PE do Flatline better, RP and HB do Glacier better, and NBN has always been better at fast advance than all the other factions. So a lot of Wayland players are feeling like, where does Wayland fit in? An unfortunate contributing factor to this is that Order and Chaos really didn't do much to push Wayland forward. In fact, as I'm going to argue later in this video, Order and Chaos did more to help other Corp factions than it did to help Wayland. The biggest shortcoming of Order and Chaos is just the amount of cards that were dedicated to the advanceable ice sort of thing. That's really never been good enough, and I would argue that it lacks ID support to really be in the competitive realm. But all of these cards contributing to this weak aspect of the Wayland card pool really didn't do much to move competitive Wayland forward. I'm going to start the list with an honorable mention, and that is Oaktown Renovation from Chrome City. I wanted to mention this card for two major reasons. First of all, this list is going to be pretty sad for Wayland players, so I wanted to include one of the best cards that they got throughout the year somewhere on the list. The other thing I wanted to mention is that Oaktown is a giant step forward in agenda design. I've talked about a lot of times how I think 4 for 2s are just bad, 5 for 3s are even worse, and generally speaking, these large agendas have been drastically underpowered. Here's one that not only recoups the cost of advancing it and scoring it, but it can also make you quite a bit of money if you over advance it. This is just really a cool idea. I really love public, and I think in general this is a really, really nice addition to the Wayland Glacier uh, archetype. Let's move on to the list proper. 
with number 10, and that's Harpsichord Studios from Old Hollywood. Here's the first NBN ID we've seen that really competes with Near Earth Hub. And the main reason for that is that you can use this in the dedicated, really heavy, flatline butcher shop styles to prevent yourself from just losing on points. So you can use this as sort of a stopgap against things like medium or R&D interface, just to make sure that you don't lose the game before you can assemble the kill. Going forward, I see Harpsichord as being one of the premier flatline strategies for NBN, and Data and Destiny has really fed a bunch of cards to this archetype that I think have pushed it into the Tier 1 realm. Next up is number 9, and that's Marcus Beatty from The Underway. This card was released in the height of the RP boom, and there was a huge Chicken Little response from the community. A lot of people were saying that Marcus Beatty was going to make RP unbeatable, that Psy games were ruining the game, and all this kind of stuff. I think it's fair to say that the sky didn't fall, and that Marcus Beatty has not even really had that big of an impact on the tournament metagame. But this has been a really interesting and sweet tool, especially for a lot of HB decks that play really devastating ice, especially things like Next Gold or some of the Ichis. So you can fire off this Beatty and trash their program, make it so they can't even break your ice. Now they're running into your trash program subroutines with no breaker, and they lose their whole rig. This card is just a really nice idea as a new defensive tool for the Corp, as a way to make ice subroutines matter more. I really like this design. I think this has worked really well. It's seen play in Jinteki as well as in HB, and I think that this card is just going to continue to see a little bit of play going into the future. Next up is number eight, and that is Team Sponsorship from the Universe of Tomorrow. This card might seem a little underwhelming if you've never played with it, but it's an absolute monster in quite a few decks. It's really good in Near Earth Hub. It's really good in HB because you can trigger the ETF effect, but you also get to get back things you need like defensive upgrades, ice that's died, Adonis campaigns that have expired, things like that. As we'll see in the runner side of this video, the Corp has had to content, contend with a lot more milling this year. There's just been way more effects that mill the corporation. Noise is still strong. So having something like this to get back those milled agendas, get back those milled ice, get back whatever it is you need to stay alive and stay in the game, this card is just great for that and has been a really huge staple in a bunch of decks this year. Next up is my number seven pick for the year, and that is Breaker Bay Grid from Breaker Bay. This card has had a lot to do with the rise of HB Glacier this year. This end interacts really, really well with both Adonis Campaign and Eve Campaign, which are definitely two of the core economic tools within the faction. This has also been nice because it gives you more blank cards that you can put into servers and make your opponent nervous that you're trying to rush out a 3 for 2. Plus, with team sponsorship now in the mix, it's really easy to get the Breaker Bay into position, get your Adonis there as well, and it's pretty easy to create these kind of second-tier remotes that are just for your economy. Next up is my number 6 pick for the year, and that's Cyberdex Virus Suite from Order and Chaos. This is the first card that let us use Purge during paid ability windows, which means that we're able to purge on our opponent's turn as well as our own turn. Plus, we get this access effect, which is kind of nice as well. Now, this was important not only against like Parasite and Data Sucker and other popular viruses like that, but it's also been the primary solution to Clot in the fast advance decks. If we're going to have a way to deal with Clot stopping our Astro Chain and our ability to fast score, we're going to have to play stuff like this in our deck as good solutions to them. And this Virus Suite has been an easy one or two of addition into a lot of the existing fast advanced decks as a good solution to Clot. Next up is my number five pick, and that's Assassin from Data and Destiny. I think it's really easy to overlook the importance of this card. Just because it's a neutral piece of ice and it's kind of in a box with a bunch of other exciting stuff, 
but I really don't think you can understate the importance of this addition to the card pool. This is a big, really hard to break century with two extremely impactful subroutines, and it's at the fairly affordable cost of seven. Glacier decks of all sorts have loved this thing, but I think this really contributes to the kind of breadth building of Glacier. This is part of the reason why we've seen lots of Glacier decks emerge in a variety of factions that aren't just the RP that we saw last year. Now we come to my number four pick for the year, and that is 24-7 News Cycle from Data and Destiny. Butcher Shop was already rising in popularity prior to the release of Data and Destiny, but I see this card as being the major turning point for Butcher Shop this year. The big thing about this card is that you can combine it with Breaking News to give the runner two tags without, the sort, without any sort of trace, without them stealing anything. You just straight up give them two tags. And that's been a really effective way to Scorched Earth your runner opponent. This card contributes the most to the rise of Plascrete Carapaces going back in a lot of runner decks. It's so easy to get flatlined by this thing. A lot of times they're playing it in a Harpsichord Studio deck, so it's really hard to score out before they can assemble the 24-7 kill. This deck was a big backdrop for Worlds. While it didn't do especially well at Worlds, I think virtually everyone was playtesting with it to some degree. And I also think that it contributed to the rise of weird metagame options, not only Plascrete, but also stuff like Turntable as a way to disrupt fast advance, but also get the breaking news out of their score area so they couldn't 24-7 with it. I see this deck being a major player going forward, but it's the type of deck that's going to cycle in and out of the metagame. It's pretty easy to beat this deck if you just play two or three Plascretes in your deck and plenty of card draw to find them quickly, but man, can it be really, really hard to beat this deck if you don't play Plascretes. My number three pick is totally a cheat and a cop-out, but I'm doing it anyway, and that is the Scientist Ice from Breaker Bay. Let me first say that I'm only talking about the three that are not in Wayland. Marumati, while seeing play a little bit, is something that we already have, and I really don't understand why the designers keep printing these end-the-run barriers with no other subroutines that are just cheap. We really need end-the-run barriers that have other subroutines that punish face-checking or do something that isn't just ending the run. So Marumati is just a forgettable, if somewhat playable, barrier that's seen a minor amount of play. Now the other three are all absolutely excellent. Gutenberg has been a monster, especially in the Rising Butcher Shop. We've seen this with Data Raven as just a huge, taxing, really pain-in-the-butt tag ice. It's got huge strength, it's hard to beat the trace, it's hard to just break it because of the strength, and it's really cheap to res. This is almost always going to be a one or two of minimum in Butcher Shop decks, just because it's such an awesome taxing ice. Similar to Gutenberg, Crick fit right into an existing archetype, which was RP. It's a cheap, nice anti-face-checking thing for Archives. It gives you some recursion for your Caprices and your Baities and things like that. And again, this is just another really excellent, decent design. Turing has arguably been the most important of the three, because I think it's really been one of the contributing factors to the rise of HB Redcoat-style Glacier. This is really nice against AI breakers. You can put it on a central if you're worried about that. But if you just want some big taxer, you can put it on a remote server and protect your stuff like Breaker Bay Grid with Adonis or just stuff like that. All three of these ice really push the envelope with ice design. They have interesting new effects. The bonus for being on a server is a really good idea. And I think that these really mark a maturity in ice design, an approach that we hadn't really seen in the past. All of these really ramp up the power level of this type of ice, and I think they're all excellent designs. Now we've come to my number two pick of the year, and that's Traffic Accident from Order and Chaos. This card is easily the biggest reason why Butcher Shop has become so popular. 
The big thing about this is at one influence, you can easily play three Scorchers and three copies of this. And even if you're on the standard 15 influence, you can afford that whole package. Now within NBN, we don't have to spend any influence on tagging mechanisms because we already have all the best ones. So basically, it's acceptable for us to spend most, if not all, of our influence on this awesome kill package that now is six cards instead of just three. I find the two tags thing to be kind of inexplicable with this card. It seems to me like the two tags thing has essentially made this card unplayable in Wayland, because the only way that you can really give two tags in Wayland is with mid-season replacements. And now that the runner has access to Film Critic, there's a really easy and good solution to mid-season, so spending your four influence on it within Wayland is maybe not as appealing. NBN, on the other hand, can play the mid-seasons for no influence, but it's also got breaking news, as well as potentially the 24-7 thing, as a method to give them two tags, and that lets you play Traffic Accident. This card's been a huge contributor to Butcher Shop. I would argue Butcher Shop was pretty weak until it got this additional package of kill cards, and I expect this card to see almost exclusive play in NBN for the foreseeable future. Now we come to my number one best card from the corpse side of the game for 2015, and that is Global Food Initiative from Data and Destiny. I put this at number one for quite a few different reasons. First of all, I've been talking about how big 5 for 3s, even 4 for 2 agendas, need to be much better. And in general, the power level of those agendas has been too low throughout the history of the game. Here's one that has a really powerful and virtually unparalleled effect that's easy to include in basically every deck because it's neutral at a low influence cost. This card has been a monster in Glacier, especially in HB Glacier, because it makes it so that your opponent basically always has to score four agendas to win, but you only need three agendas to win. And that makes five for threes and just including five for threes in your deck a lot less of a liability when they're only going to get two points from stealing it. Another critical point is that this card counts as three points for your required 20 or 21 agenda points. But since the runner's only going to get two when they steal it, this effectively lowers your agenda density. And for that reason, we've seen this shoehorned into a lot of decks, including decks like the NBN Fast Advance deck, just as a replacement for NAPD contract, a nice way to play fewer agendas and also lower your agenda density. I'm kind of conflicted about this card because, in my opinion, something like this would make a lot more sense if it was in a faction rather than just like a neutral 5 for 3 floating around. I've said many times that I like the idea of each faction having a difficult to steal or somehow tricky 5 for 3, and to me this seems like it would have been pretty good in a faction. But overall my feelings about this card are positive. I think this is a really huge ratchet up of the power level of 5 for 3s, and this is the direction that we need to go with big agendas if they're going to ever really see any play. Before we go, I'd like to give my pick for the worst corp card of the year, and if my biases didn't show through in the actual top 10 list, I think they definitely will show through here. I'm going to pick It's a Trap from Old Hollywood. There are a lot of cards in my short list for the worst card, that just have some sort of narrow effect that isn't well incorporated in the game. So things like Constellation Protocol or Dedicated Technician Team. But I think the thing with It's a Trap is not only does it have a very narrow ability that's not well incorporated in the form of Anti-Expose Effect, but it's also just kind of a bad piece of ice overall. Now there were plenty of bad pieces of ice released this year, I definitely had Clairvoyant Monitor also in my shortlist for Bad Ice this year. But man, It's a Trap I think exemplifies everything that's been wrong with Trap Type Ice. The low strength makes it easily beaten with Parasite or with some of the AI Breakers. And the fact that it costs 2 and has such a low impact subroutine, 
it's so easy to just mitigate this thing by having some piece of junk card installed. And I think the tendency this year especially has been that runner decks just have a bunch of stuff installed and they're pretty willing to just lose some bad card. Outside of the lame Admiral Akbar reference, the anti-expose effect really just has no place on this card. That would be much more well suited for a more generic, like end the run kind of ice. Imagine this was just a 2 or 3 cost low strength end of the run barrier, then there might be some reasons why you'd want to switch out your Baco for this as a metagame choice if you were worried about certain expose effects. But as it is, you have to play this really narrow use ice that has virtually no impact on the game outside of the anti-expose thing, and you have to waste a slot in your deck also, have I ever mentioned in any of my videos that expose effects suck? Well, that's going to do it for part one of the video. Be sure to tune into part two where we look at all the runner cards from the year. I've got my top 10 list over there as well as my worst card of the year for runner. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, click the button that looks like a thumbs up, and leave me a comment. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in part two.